Okay, so today I will talk about surface reconstruction uh, and its applications in scientific visualization. Uh, I will also show some independent scientific and information visualization applications and ideas. Uh, so for the surface reconstruction, uh, we can do it explicitly or implicitly. Uh, an explicit representation is about piecewise representation of the surface embedded in 3D or of a curve embedded in 2D. Uh, so this slide is mainly talking about that. Uh, basically, if my shape is a mathematically defined one, I can also I can avoid piecewise business and just draw a continuous representation. But in general, I will be dealing with these arbitrary shapes. So I will uh, explicitly represent them using polygons, polygon pieces in 3D. Uh, yeah, so this was about that. Implicit representation is the opposite. Uh, it's a totally different idea. Here the surface is defined to be the zero set of a scalar valued function f. So in this scenario, I have this function uh, and the points uh, that uh, set this function to zero are my interesting in uh, are the points that I am interested in. Basically, in in this circle of radius r example, that would be the points that uh, makes this function square root x square y square minus r equal to zero. Right. So if I plug the correct value here, I will end up at the boundary of this circle. Similarly, if I plug a value that is not on the boundary, it can be negative meaning that I am inside and it can be positive meaning that I am outside. So this function is called also the kernel. Uh, it's, uh, so th this function, uh, the kernel of this function gives me the uh, boundary in 2D or 3D or in any dimension actually. Uh, and in explicit representation I don't have that kind of a function. I have, uh, if the shape is mathematically defined, then I have a different function, but in general, I don't even have this one. So, in explicit representation, like the common case here, this map or whatever, uh, so we need to do a piecewise approximation where pieces are lines in 2D and it will be polygons in 3D, as I told before. And in implicit representation, basically there is no piecewise business. There is this function where zero means black boundary and z uh, one means out, and uh, there may be a continuous <clears throat> transition from out to inside, like the gray pixels here, gray values here. So in general, we go with the explicit representation uh, if we will be doing rendering for instance because it is quite easy to render uh, the polygons that represent my surface there are uh, hardware <coughs> implementations available for polygon rendering so it is quite fast uh, also i can modify this uh, shape easily like uh, since i have explicit access to polygons and points i can drag them around to get to shapes as we will see in the shape deformation match the formation class uh, and in contrast implicit representation is the way to go when you will do a lot of in out tests for instance it is very easy to do it because you will be basically evaluating this f function if it is negative you are inside it is that simple uh, yeah so let's do uh, so i will talk about both reconstruction methods in the explicit and in the implicit so here, this is the level set of a function defines the shape. Level means function values are the same at the same level. So that's why we call it level set. Traditionally, this level is zero, but it can be any number. In fact, if it is zero, then this situation is arising, negative inside, positive outside. Uh, so a 2D function ex accepts two uh, variables as its input and uh, the variable the output is a scalar value and from that I can 
extract my 1D curve. Similar literary function expects 3D inputs and I can extract polygons out of that as we will see later using Martian cubes. Uh, so what is this F then? Most common and natural representation is something called sine distance function SDF. So given a 3D point in R3, uh, this function will return a scalar value. But before going there, uh, let me mention that other than STF, there are other uh, functions. So from radiology domain, uh, CT scanners, MRI scanners, they provide us intensity values. This is just like a scalar. This is just exactly a, a scalar function. So it just works like the STF, but it's a totally different mechanism. So. Uh, and if you wonder, uh, I am not an expert in radiology, but uh, a very rough description can be as follows. Amount of vibration caused by the magnets in MRI gives you that intensity, and in CT, the uh, X-ray, uh, journey of the X-ray through the body inside the CT tunnel gives that intensity values. Again, it's not super related to our class. But this is a very useful application, and we will see an example of this, how to visualize uh, this color field. Uh, so it is an important scientific visualization application, actually. But now let's go back to geometry. Uh, this uh, winding number is a, a recent uh, contribution to computer graphics. Uh, this is very cool it is very robust uh, it is basically measuring the amount number of turns full turns so if you are inside the body it would be one like this if you are outside it would be uh, zero and uh, let me show you a quick demo on that actually i have recently found this it's quite uh, explanatory in my opinion so if it works here in my internet Mm. It's coming. Sorry about the wait. Uh, it's it is worth waiting. Of course, if it comes at some point, it would be nice. And okay, so uh, see the green point is inside. It makes a one full turn, right? And the red point is outside. It cannot be. Able, it will. It won't be able to make one full turn. So let me run it one more time. And let's do it one last time. This is inside one full turn and outside some part of the turn cancels the other part so part so I end up with zero turn. Yeah, so and the way to compute this number is basically an accumulation of angles around the polygon in 2D and in 3D it is slightly more involved, but still the same idea. Um, so this uh, Let's compare this with the standard de facto sine distance function. So basically, let me show it quickly. I have a grid, so I want to compute the SDF of, of this grid, uh, of this point. It doesn't matter about the gridding here. Uh, so the way we compute is basically, I am looking for this distance, right? From this uh, point uh, to this surface, but there is no surface. I only have this red input. So first thing to do it, is to fit a plane that locally approximates this surface which is this plane so you will get the k nearest neighbors of this red guy so you will get your ni normal of your plane in blue basically i am interested in this distance right from x to this surface the plane surface so what how can i get it basically dot product of this vector from o to x projected on my uh, normal using dot product and remember dot product gives me the length of this projection so this length is exactly the length that I am looking for and it is positive when you are outside if your point is right here inside so I will do the same tactic so I will again this is the closest point actually this is the closest point but let's ignore that for a second assume this is the closest so you will this will be your vector from uh, O to X, this is my new X now, and the normal is fixed, the same normal, and the projection of 
this vector to this normal will be negative, right? Because I have, I have the circulation going on. So this is the ni, and this is the x minus oi. This projection will go to the back side of this uh, n vector, so it will be negative. Similarly, if it is on the surface, like if it is right here, let me draw it from this part. So if it is on the surface, so in this case, surface is the blue uh, plane, right? Then that vector would be this. Uh, so let's zoom it here a little bit. Uh, then the dot product of two orthogonal vectors would be zero and the distance to that surface would be zero as expected yeah so uh, and by the way why did i mention this so with that uh, stf if your input is quite uh, undersampled and it, is, uh, it has this narrow uh, transitions etc then it it may get confused so in this case let's Try to find the sign distance function of this key value, key point. Okay, it's inside, right? So this is my shape, it is inside. Uh, with that logic, S would be my closest point. So I will draw a vector from S to G, like this vector. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, the normal around uh, S would be again like this, the local tangent plane. And the dot product of this vector over this would be positive, so it say, it would say that G is outside, but it's not true, G is actually inside. Yeah, so, uh, but with winding number you won't have a problem like this. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, so, surface reconstruction. Uh, doing it so this would be my input point cloud that I could do an explicit reconstruction or an implicit reconstruction uh, if the explicit one I need to touch all the points and I will uh, interpolate them I will pass through them and these points could be faulty because the source can be a scanner it is not perfect etc so explicit reconstruction will not be perfect if your input is not perfect so it's a big problem with implicit one you will approximate the surface like don't necessarily pass through the points so it will give you a manifold without any uh, weird junctions uh, so i guess i am repeating myself here uh, so do <clears throat> these are the red ones are the explicit reconstructions they just approximate the point set either smoothly uh, global sm globally smooth approximation or piecewise smooth approximation like the joints of the pieces aren't necessarily smooth and in explicit one it is as i told you interpolating the points it is like connecting to that situation happening here so it is basically an ill post problem do i want one do i want sharp corner or like this one so um, to remedy this problem elevate this problem we need to regularize with priors <clears throat> like uh, i need to have some a prior knowledge to uh, avoid this ill post effect so explicit reconstruction I can talk about this crust algorithm power crust algorithm it's quite popular basically what it does is uh, it makes use of this theoretically sound Delaunay triangulation and since it encodes the proximity between the points if the points are dense enough we should have the desired triangles within that triangulation so once you have that uh, the Delaunay triangulation of your point set in 2D you definitely have the vertices that you are looking for and in 3D you will just replace the triangles with tetrahedron but let's stick with 2D now so the algorithm is basically this compute the Delaunay triangulation of the point set 
this is what I do here so do you see here uh, there are some delanoi edges outside the point set but still so we have the edges we need like these edges right these are the ones I need but also have the extras like this one uh, uh, so we we need to get rid of them and uh, the, the, the way they do it is uh, they complete the Voronoi diagram uh, of the, this point set as well uh, and then they make the intersection of Voronoi edges and uh, Delanoi edges so <clears throat> yeah, it is just a general idea here basically uh, you can find the details in the paper uh, there is another explicit reconstruction algorithm called Poisson reconstruction uh, and another one is defined here so this is even more easy to understand so let me just go through this quickly uh, basically you have to first find the local neighborhood of each point okay in your point plot use a KD tree to find K nearest neighbors uh, then attack a tangent plane using PCA we have seen this in our previous class how to do that like the covariance matrix of I eigenvectors of the covariance matrix business anyway so now I have uh, ally uh, for each neighborhood I have this uh, tangent plane so I project all the points making up that neighborhood to that tangent plane so now I am in 2D then do the Delano triangulation uh, and which is a valid triangulation in 2D and lift them back to 3D to their original positions and in the end you will do this for all the local neighborhoods so compose the final triangulation by merging all of these local ones now let me go to the implicit business uh, so we have kind of the, uh, talked about this but let's do it here uh, clearly I have the point set my task my goal is to uh, find the curve around it right because this is the most intuitive thing to do so to do that I will define a scalar field which is defined on every point not necessarily on the surface input points but also on all other points so basically I will put a, an invisible grid, grid around it okay uh, yeah so and then I will run my sign distance function to uh, find this col this coloring like red meaning inside etc and then I will extract the zero sets uh, so it is the repetition of what I said input point put uh, embedded in to a grid so if it's 2d your grid will be a 2d grid if it is 3D input, your grid will be a grid composed of cubes. Uh, and speaking of grids, basically there are also rectilinear grids. So, uh, like we have, we don't have squares but rectangles basically. Structured grids, we have regular degree sets, grid vertices. We have unstructured grid, there is no pattern at all. It is scattered, it's not a grid it's just a set of points uh, but we will stick with the uniform grid here so it is also known as regular grid so just like I mentioned for all the grid points I compute this sign distance function so it leaves me with these squares in 2d and cubes in 3d so what are the interesting ones definitely this is not interesting right because all of them are outside so this is the square corresponding to that region I will just discard it similarly I will discard all in squares and I will only use the hybrid ones which are partially inside and from that I will be interested in the edges that have this in to out uh, sorry out to in transitions so if this is the uh, configuration then I will be creating this piece in 2d it will be a line piece in 3d it will be a triangle piece 
uh, and there will be multiple options here uh, and there will be a lookup table uh, so it will be a constant time to look at that up it is very fast it is very robust and uh, because of the lookup table the neighbor neighboring squares or cubes are arranged properly so this uh, piece will be connected to the neighboring piece automatically and uh, and uh, with a good shape so we, there won't be any non-manifold situations <clears throat> yeah so if I recap you discretize this space like a regular grid evaluate the SDF on the grid points classify the grid points based on the evaluation classify the grid edges compute intersections and connect intersections so computation of intersections is also an interesting topic so okay if this is the edge I will have a point on this edge but where will that point be in the middle close to the red one close to the green one so there will be a linear interpolation going on uh, to answer that question another little trick here sometimes uh, I end up with a square like this in 2D or this is the ID extends to 3D as well so in this scenario so let me draw that square here so these are the in points these are the outside points okay so there will be two possibilities to triangulate this or to uh, define pieces based on this uh, square I can either go like this so this is one option or I can go so let me draw the zigzaggy I can go like this it is totally ambiguous so what we do is we sample the center point so we upsample our grid points which is fine and we also evaluate SDF in the center point if it is inside uh, then you will pick this direction and this would lead uh, to this output right you are connecting two pieces if it is outside then you will select the opposite uh, possibility and it will basically break the contour yeah so uh, this is something we discussed before SDF uh, so associate the tangent plane with each sample point uh, because tangent points are local linear approximations to the surface and then based on the normal of the tangent plane uh, and the grid point and the dot product you compute your sine distance function as discussed so here is another way to see it clearly and the way to fit a tangent plane is based on computing the k nearest neighbors of s of the uh, input point and then apply principal component analysis on the set of closed points basically to do that we compute the covariance matrix of this set and take the eigenvectors and i will in 3d i will end up with three eigenvectors because covariance will be three by three and i will select the minimum the smallest eigenvector why because uh, basically if this is the plane uh, so if these are the points on the plane so the principal direction would be this first eigenvector the second one will be orthogonal to this still on the plane the, uh, and it still captures some variation right, right because we also have variation here and the last one will be very tiny if it is a perfect plane actually if, if the points are literally coplanar then it will be a zero vector but in uh, in the other common cases they, they won't be coplanar so I have a very small eigenvector uh, so I draw it big here but so it is pointing from this plane out, out of my screen so the eigenvalue associated with this eigenvector is very small because the variation here is uh, smallest so I will pick that third axis as my 
plain normal and in 2d the points will be uh, like that so the first eigenvector with the direction of these points and the second one like this one is normal to this line right I will set the second one uh, yeah. we are assuming that the third eigenvalue is really smaller compared to the other two otherwise I have this ambiguous situation like if the points are collected if the neighborhood looks like a sphere basically okay so this is not a good way to draw a sphere let me redo it uh, if the points are all on this sphere then this is the first eigenvector this will be the second one and the third one will be hitting to the face closer to me but it will still be undecided right which direction to go so hopefully my local neighborhood will be so small that it won't have this complicated nonlinear shapes it will just have this linear plane so then the question is how to find k nearest neighbors of s so it is you can just do it k times find the max distance k times in all k n time but you can also use a kd3 uh, to find this uh, closest distance in log n time you will still do it k times so it will be k log n in the end it is a huge benefit so i will show you how to do it but now to keep things in order let's assume that we have this data structure and you can also skip this part if you know the kd3 so i am skipping it currently i will return it later uh, if we stick with the martian cubes algorithm here so we efficiently computed the sine distance function because I have this KD3 so I have the K nearest neighbors etc uh, and then the only thing left is the fi to find the intersection point so as I mentioned so okay this is an interesting edge there will be a peace point here end point what will it be in the middle here here where so to answer that question I will invite you to this slide basically i know that this point evaluates to f equal to zero because it is on the surface or on the boundary so f is zero by definition i also know the f values of the left and right endpoints of this edge so i can write this uh, simple interpolation function right basically f is equal to u times f1 and 1 minus u times f0 in other words if u is 1 it means that i get all the way or everything from f1 because this point is literally here which makes sense if u is 0 i am basically here i will get all the contribution from f0 so from here i can find u as a scalar value so it is like 0 0.7 or something then comes the ray tracing part if you say uh, if you think of it that way Basically, I am at this x point. I will go to x1 point. So from x0, I will go in this direction, which is computed by this vector from x1. Sorry, from x0 to x1. So this is the vector. Uh, and I will go u amount on this direction, starting from x0. Right? and u so what is u i have just computed you in in the previous step so i plug that value and it gives me the perfect spot where f is zero yeah so that was it actually martian cubes is complete now uh, there are alternatives actually the old ones is not better than that obviously cuberial method it comes uh to the to an intermediate step so it leaves the output in the cube version it doesn't extract polygons out of that so it is still okay but obviously martian cubes version is a better uh, result uh, more smooth uh, but notice that there are excessive number of triangles in the martian cubes output so then there may be some post-processing remeshing operations to Fix those problems, we will see it in another class.
so grid resolution issues if i keep the resolution too high uh, too low sorry then i will be missing points right because uh, so you i have let's make it a finger so uh, this is my index finger this would be my middle finger etc i will go further so if you keep your resolution this size you will probably capture every part of it right but if you keep the resolution very big like you are dealing with this resolution then you will extract one surface one piece from this big square basically uh, depending on your situation so from outside to inside probably uh, you will be getting that one right and the neighboring voxel or yeah voxel or cube will give me another thing so see i missed the gap between the fingers okay this is exactly what is happening in this scenario so why not keep the resolution very high then then it will be an overkill right for the planar regions i will have little little cubes representing one planar region like the in this case the belly of the horse so there are many triangles again so here so i can certainly do less number of triangles around these planarish parts so other examples uh, yeah so i have this hand example anyway this is the problem actually it's even worse here yeah so these are the Martian cubes results I can put this in action using a using so now I can connect to scientific visualization because I have this scientific data from my uh, radiology uh, friends like the CT <coughs> scans basically these are set of images uh, layered up together it, they come in so I will just talk about the practical implementation issue here it comes in the icon format so in my experience i prefer to convert it into this knee format with that software um, and then i i need some intensity value right it is not necessarily zero in the sdf case so in that example i'm interested in the skull which is the bone so i uh, hover my mouse over the that uh, in region of interest for me and I learned intensity values like 200 between 200 and 225 maybe then I will use Martian cubes to extract that uh, that scalar field that, that, that uh, particular value like 223 to do that so there is this knee file reader that i downloaded from somewhere uh, and the part that i just mentioned will be this my data where the grid data the all the intensity values are read into this data array so it is the grid is three by three by the, the grid is three dimensional with height depth but i just uh, flatten it into a 1d array okay then uh, so for width height depth so for every every intensity value uh, i first uh, associate an xyz 3d point with that so this will be the center of the cube and if that cube is a skull like so this function basically checks the intensity value in that data array and if it if that intense value is in some particular interval that i am looking for then it returns true so i come here and i add that vox that voxel so that intensity value with that coordinates to my voxels vector or linkness whatever and if not i just skip them so, and then i uh, move to the right by uh, increasing right a little bit where is it happening uh, so basically here I am 
going up so I reset the right uh, yeah to right plus plus is happening here so in in that row layer I go to right etc so it is detail but uh, this is how people do this uh, first step to Martian cubes so you detect your uh, voxels your cubes and then you run your you march through them using this Martian cubes algorithm uh, so now let's uh, as I promised let me just talk about this KD3 business a little bit it is basically a multi k dimensional binary search tree right it's and geometrically what it does is it uh, divides the space wisely so let me do it with a quick example 37 it would be my root okay 37 so basically at every level at uh, with uh, with a new layer i alternate my decision dimension so here i will look at the x coordinate in this level i will look at y coordinates in the next level i will look at x coordinates to alternate in the next level y coordinates etc of course if it is 3d it will be xyz 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 etc so 3 7 now 8 1 comes and i will look at the x coordinates so 8 is bigger than 3 binary search logic i have this node okay 8 1 then 6 6 comes 6 is bigger than 3 go to right now i will look at the y dimension so 6 versus 1 6 is bigger so go to right that is the tricky part actually if i have looked at the x dimension 6 is less than 8 so i would have gone here but i look at this dimension this is the idea basically so see i did it's only up to this point but it gives you the idea but the part i am interested in this actually so it divides this space partitions it smartly so with 3 7 basically i divide it in the whole space into left and right the guys less than this line uh, there's this point that uh, generates this line and the guys more than uh, the greater than this point then the next uh, node in my tree is 8 1 it is in the right sub tree so i go to i remember where is the tree okay so 8 1 is in the right of the parent so go to this right and attack to this right hand side and do it up and down not le not left and right but up and down because in the blue layer i am interested in the y coordinates which is responsible for vertical moves and here this is left right horizontal moves it is the idea actually done 6 6 6 6 is this point uh, and it would be in the x part so it will basically do left and right device this region only this region not anywhere else, uh, uh, anywhere else into left and right so with that logic all the space is divided into uh, partitions uh, and then when it comes to do the query uh, I will do this idea as I get closer to the query point we are cutting out all the sub trees that are far away so if the green is my query point uh, the algorithm should return vertex 5 right because it is the closest but let's see how it does it so I compute my KD tree as uh, before. So I have this representation, but how do I traverse over it? So start from the root, root to query. It is the champion distance currently. <clears throat> so go towards the root. So I go to the left child because it is closer. So it would be three. So this distance is closer than the green one. So update the champion. So this is the current closest tree. And something wonderful happens here. What is that? We won't search the right sub tree. When I come back to one after this part is over, because because of this geometric effect, actually, uh, this distance, I already have this distance in my hand and it would be impossible for a point to have a smaller distance than this green distance ok 
okay so basically your recursion will skip all the million points on the right hand side and with that logic let's go uh, even further so I am at 3 now look at the top of 3 6 not closer do nothing look at the uh, so I am at 6 look at the left of 6 there is no one do nothing uh, right sub 3 of again empty do nothing now the bottom of 3 I get 4 but 4 is still not that good so look at 3 is still the champion look at the left sub 3 of 4 5 5 is better so update the champion 5 is the champion and uh, top of above of top of 5 is empty bottom of 5 is empty so there won't be any updating <clears throat> and when I uh, roll back my recursion uh, there will be branch outs like in node 1 in node 4 etc yeah so that was the kd3 crash tutorial now let me do scientific visualization i have already done it uh, using uh, the martian cubes on uh, medical image data uh, basically it would be a scalar field uh, visualization where a scalar value is associated with each point in n-dimensional space again is uh, intensity from CT machines or STF or winding number can help me get that scalars get those scalars uh, there will also be vector field visualization and here the idea is ND vector is associated, associated with each ND point okay uh, and this can be obtained through simulations <clears throat> yeah so Scalar field visualization can be done with an indirect method like isosurface extraction as we have done or I can also do it directly by sending rays to the volume and vector field visualization can be done uh, using some uh, vector drawing actually essentially uh, so for the DVR direct visualization this is the idea for that pixel the color will be based on by sending a ray from the camera that passes through that pixel to the volume and as this ray intersects the voxels of interest uh, there will be predefined opacity values and intensity values and I will blend them in and put that value to that pixel so this is the opposite of the forward method where I have this Three, this shape I just projected to the to the image plane so that's why ray casting is known as the backward is a backward method it is basically similar to ray tracing that we study in computer graphics in ray tracing we have primary rays from the camera through that pixel as well as the secondary rays like for reflection refraction shadows uh, and it was introduced in 19 79 ray casting is an older version it is dealing with only the primary rays okay uh, so it's easier in that sense there won't be any shadow etc and ray tracing i have a slice on that issue in the computer graphics course i taught so i won't go there now if you're interested you can take a look at them as well so with uh, ray casting I have a ray so basically with ray tracing I have ray surface intersection happening all the time but in this scenario I have a volume there is no surface so where will what will I do with the ray surface intersection as I mentioned uh, I collect the uh, predefined values from the uh, volumes voxels in the absence of surface vector field visualization so let's do some let's see some vector fields uh, uh, so basically the idea is I have n-dimensional n space and n-dimensional vectors are at each point of this space it arises in fluid simulation airflow simulation etc uh, so here is a vector field for you 2d input 2d output 
another vector 3d input 3d output so this is output first component second component and third component so these are all vector fields uh, so the first way to visualize it is uh, again for every point I have a vector this value can come from a simulation like fluid simulation or airflow simulation uh, so vector is an entity with a direction and magnitude if you try to draw the vector based on their magnitudes then it the long the longer ones the powerful vectors will dominate the picture it will mess up the picture by the way these are the screenshots from youtube channels from khan academy and three blue and brown channels uh, they have nice illustrations you can go check their videos on this issue uh, so so what will we do since the magnitude cannot be drawn explicitly to the screen because it will ruin the image you can do color coding like blue for small uh, values red for high values you can also combine scaling with the colors like then blues are go going away because it is very small and red is unit length so the largest length you allow is one it prevents mess because there won't be anything longer than one unit a case study on fluid flow so here the blue points are droplets of water they will mo move according to the vectors visualized on the picture initial state so based on these vectors this uh, this droplet for instance it will go down right because that that region is governed by this vector etc uh, so basically vectors are representing the velocities of particles of fluids here instead it they can also represent force of gravity magnetic field etc and this is color vector fields and visualization is basically just an arrow without any color coding uh, it depicts a steady state system so here see what is happening if you look at the diagonal you it will convert to this line because of because there is no deviation out of of diagonal etc here is a vector field that is dynamic it is more realistic indeed vector fields may change over time like in real word fluid flow because the velocities of the particles change in response to the surrounding context because of collisions etc uh, and then again if you do the maximum length one and then proportional drawing I will have this uh, visualization in 3d my vectors will be 3D because it is a definition. ND spaces are equipped with ND vectors. So 3D spaces will be 3D space will be equipped with 3D vector. So this is not so clear, but uh, here is something that we can deal with easily. If this is my X Y Z coordinate frame that is uh, pointing out of the screen, this vector with vector at each point. So regardless of X Y Z, the output doesn't depend on x y z so it is always one zero zero right all the vectors are going to right so what's happening here pop quiz to you uh, same coordinate frame uh, so again I have this situation about x moment right but the thing is it is not constant here it is constant one it is not constant here as I go up it grows so basically it depends on y value and as i go down it also grows but it changes direction so it is exactly y and the other components are zero zero yeah. here is just another one uh, so we can also uh, grasp this actually uh, x y z the x coordinates so for the points that are on the x-axis it will be a total uh, it will be a direct vector in this direction x direction so a related topic is information visualization 
and here the information can be a social network uh, data or protein data etc uh, so I may want to draw this graph of social network wisely to uh, understand the internal structure better uh, or protein visualization is important to understand the binding of different proteins together another one is matrix visualization basically here this matrix encodes pairwise similarity between pairs of points like in this case it would be uh, the point pairs will be these blue points okay the points will be the blue spheres and the distance the value are the geodesic distance okay so from hand to head it will be 67 so vertex 1 to vertex 7 maybe this part or whatever it will be 67 and it will be symmetric because 7 to 1 will also be 67 uh, so what MDS does is uh, information about the pairwise distances in that case it would be geodetic distance is translated into a configuration of endpoints met into the Euclidean space so how do I do this translation like this so this is the matrix entry and the axis in the M MDS embedding the output points so these points okay, the, 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 these points they will be in such a configuration that their Euclidean distance will be very similar, hopefully exactly the same, as the corresponding matrix entry. Okay, so if you minimize this least square function, uh, and if you do the geodesic similarity, then no matter what your pose is, you end up with the same MDS embedding. And hence, this is a nice information visualization. It re removes the bendings from your life. You can visualize this information better. In this case, information is again the geodesic similarity between point pairs. Let's do finally the uh, protein visualization. Uh, so there are popular modes like ball and stick. First of all, what's the protein? It is a set of atoms uh, bound together using uh, bonds. Uh, Covalent bond bonds, uh, and in ball and stick mode, atoms are displayed as spheres and bonds as cylinders, and the sizes of them will vary depending on the information. In Lucarice, it is uh, very similar except they have the same size, and line only the bonds are displayed by lines, points, etc. <coughs> So let's uh, see this in action actually. Uh, okay, so surface is the overall surface of this protein data line. So we kind of discussed this on the bonds as lines, as you can see. The corrize, so we are supposed to see spheres and cylinders here. Cartoon, so what is cartoon for instance? So we have these backbones. This this is the longest uh, chain of atom a atoms. Uh, and in cartoon representation, we focus on this backbones. Actually, we put uh, uh, curves around them. Uh, and in particular, so I will leave you with this website link. It is a quite cool uh, website where state of the art protein data visualization can be found. So here, this screenshot is from this address uh, of this Brucella virus. Uh, you can change the mode here. So it is the space fill mode. So what is space fill mode? Basically, uh, only the atoms are displayed as a set of spheres uh, where there is no uh, gap between the spheres. So this is the space fill mode. Again, you can change the style by using this uh, combo box uh, etc yeah so with that I will stop thanks